Right, good morning. What I want to deal with here is the second question, part two of it, in the additional assessment to do with the subject of pessimism about technological progress and its contribution to economic growth. Particular slides you should be looking at in terms of that lecture are slides 46, 47, 51 to 58. Now to start with, you do need to put it into context. How might we know that technological progress has been or might be relatively slow? Well, one thing that we do look at is the rate of growth of productivity, labour productivity, output per worker. And it has slowed down, certainly since 2008. I gave you various figures there in the lecture slide. In the UK, in the United States, and indeed in many other Western economies, substantially lower in the last 11, 12 years compared to the trend since the 1950s. So, what might the arguments be for being pessimistic? Uh, now, I give you five or six arguments, I think, in the lecture. They're sometimes overlapping but let's just go through them now. First of all the golden age argument. Now this is basically the claim that what happened in the 1950s, the 1960s when we did have relatively high labour productivity growth in some sense this was exceptional. Something to do with uh, coming out of the Second World War, pent-up consumer demand, a lot of technological uh, innovations needing to be uh, commercialised to be applied. Uh, I do give you examples there. Uh, jet engine, nuclear power, antibiotics, radar. Uh, second argument relates to diminishing returns and then I broke that up into a number of examples, some of which are actually quite interesting um, and don't maybe get enough attention. Uh, the, the average travel time, assuming of course you could fly at the moment, uh, from Europe to North America, 2020, is no faster than it was in 1958, even though we've obviously invested billions of pounds in more advanced, and in some ways better quality, passenger aircraft. Diminishing returns also, I uh, note in terms of military technology, uh, a jet fighter today, in 2020, might cost, when, even when you allow for inflation, 80, 90, 100 times more in rail terms compared to its Second World War equivalent. Nuclear power may be another example. Why is it that in the UK and the United States uh, it's extremely difficult and extremely expensive to build um, atomic power stations? Pharmaceuticals, uh, drugs uh, for, for healthcare, uh, another extremely interesting and indeed at the moment, of course, as we hope for a vaccine, a very relevant example, but um, to develop a new drug takes years and billions and billions of R&D. Now, another argument, a bit related to what was before, particularly in the American context, economists like uh, Robert Gordon, Tyler Cowen, have argued that all the easy gates have already been exploited some time ago. Further argument, again from the United States, but it applies more widely, is that when you introduce a new technological system, you do get an advance in productivity, but it only happens once. Uh, you get it at the time, and then you're at a new higher level, no further gains. A lot of research has been applied uh, to show how this happens, particularly the example of um, highways, what we would on this side of the Atlantic call motorways um, in the United States from the 1950s through to the mid 1960s. Um, further example, the end of Murr's Law. Now Murr's Law, something very important in the electronic side of the economy, the argument that uh, every two years the capacity on a uh, microchip, basically the number of transistors it uh, holds, doubles. Now obviously that gives you exponential growth. Very important in terms of consumer electronics. Um, the basis of advances, for example, in smartphones and all that, which we benefit from. But it has been argued, as that miniaturization has gone further and further, we've basically got to a sort of atomic level, subatomic level. We 
you can't go any further. Murray's law is ending, and therefore the great sort of cost savings that we've seen in terms of laptops, tablets, uh, smartphones, that will come to an end. Now, there's some debate about whether this is actually the case. There may be new ways of doing computing, quantum computers, whatever. I don't understand them, but they may or may not work. Um, but Murray's law could be a challenge. So, I think you also have to acknowledge in passing it, that there are optimistic views about what might happen to technological growth in the future. But finally, and obviously this is something I didn't reflect in the previous lecture notes, I think the implication of the current difficulties we're in, that, and indeed the longer term impact of the shutdown of the economy and the way that people's behaviour changes on the basis of that, given the COVID situation, are not good for long term productivity growth. Uh, people will be more reluctant to invest because of uncertainty, people more reluctant to travel, particularly internationally, and uh, global supply chains will be pulled back. All of those could have negative effects on uh, technological change and productivity. So that those are some notes or uh, points uh, for guidance on the second question, part two. Uh, technological pessimism uh, in the additional assessment and hope you're all keeping well and safe. Thank you. Bye.